All right, welcome. In this video, we're going to be talking about the definition of a limit for AP Calculus. And we're going to spend most of our time here today, you know, determining values of limits from a picture of a graph. Uh, but we'll also work on some scenarios where, you know, the function's given algebraically or we're looking at a table of values, as you can see. So we're going to start off with this function f of x, which is equal to x squared minus 5x minus 6, all divided by x minus 6. Get it all in there. All right. And hopefully you look at that numerator. You see that x squared minus 5x minus 6, and you feel like, ah, oh, this is a math class, you know, we're at the beginning of another one. I should probably factor this thing. And sure enough, factoring will be something we need to be able to do in this class. But my message to you is it's not going to be that intense. So in this particular case, we think to ourselves, you know, what's two numbers that multiply to negative 6 and add to negative 5? And you've got to be careful with 5 and the 6, right? This is where you can go wrong because it's very easy. But we're just going to avoid that by checking our work, right? So I feel like negative 6 and positive 1 is going to be the way to go, um, partially because those numbers multiply to negative 6 and add to negative 5, but also because x minus 6 is part of the denominator. And we might expect things to cancel, right, if we're working with a function like this. Okay, and they won't always, but, you know, we might expect that. Okay, now we see that those x minus 6's are identical factors on top and bottom, so those would cancel. Like, those are always equal to 1 if I'm dividing a number by itself unless they're equal to 0. So this fraction is going to equal x plus 1 provided x is not equal to 6. And so I'm going to write that out there to remind myself. f of x equals x plus 1 when x is not equal to 6. Well, it's equal to x plus 1 for all x except for x equals 6. So there's just this one place where the rule doesn't apply. And if we think back to the original definition of f, if we plugged in x equals 6, we would divide by 0, so the function is going to be undefined. This is a hole in the graph. Okay, so we know how to graph y equals x plus 1. We've known that for quite a while. It's a line with positive slope and an x-intercept of 1. Okay, if it's got a hole in the graph, I might just, you know, draw that little hole there. Um, but I know the x location of the hole, right? That's going to happen at x equals 6. Okay, something we're going to be interested in here is, you know, what's the y-coordinate of that hole? Because that's going to be equivalent to the question of what's the limit of the function as x approaches 6. Okay, so if we think about, well, the on all the points on the line, y is equal to x plus 1, so the coordinate of the hole should be, you know, x plus 1 as well, so we say, okay, that's going to have y coordinate 7. Okay, now, g of x, and you can make a table of values if you want, but I'm just going to show you the values of g of x. This is sine x divided by x, which is kind of an interesting function, but it's not all that interesting. Um, if I was to run this into a table, uh, and these are the values I would get. What I want you to see from this table, though, is the closer x gets to 0 from the negative side and the positive side, right, where x is negative 0 0.01, 0 0.001, negative 0 0.0005, negative 0 0.003, this is getting really close to 0, right? Um, more 9s are appearing. I'm getting closer and closer to 1. And then I see the same thing from the positive numbers. You know, as the positive numbers get smaller and smaller, more decimals are staying the same. This is the idea of the limit. g of x is not defined at x equals 0, but it sure looks like the values of g are getting really close to 1 as x gets close to 0. And then, you know, in the same way, looking back at that graph of f, the closer x gets to 6, the closer y gets to 7. And this is something we'll want to come back on in a moment. Okay, now on the topic of one-sided limits, it's kind of hard to put a definition of this down at the AP calculus level, right? Because we don't get into epsilons and deltas in this class, and I think for good reason. This is just a high school calculus class. We are really concerned with concept um, and not always the, you know, hardcore analysis of the situation. So, what I'm saying is, yeah, as x approaches some number from the negative side, that describes uh, behavior from the left. And I, I know it says it right there on your page, but I'm just going to be even more uh, explicit there. And then as x approaches c from the positive side, that is, we're talking about, oh, whoops, that didn't go so well. We're talking about behavior from the right-hand side. <laughs> I think a good place to start with, you know, discussion of one-sided limits is going to be a piecewise function. Okay, now, if you are unfamiliar with piecewise functions, that's okay. It's not a big deal. It's really not a 
not that complicated of a concept. It's just like different rules are applying at different times, right? Um, I have videos about piecewise functions. If you're interested in them, I'll dig them up and make a card and you can just like kind of click up there. Um, but I'm going to just draw a graph of this function f of x right now and then we'll use that to determine the values of the limits. So I'm going to start with this first piece of the piecewise defined function. Uh, f of x equals 2x plus 4 when x is less than 3. Okay, so that's a line segment with a positive slope um, and an intercept of 4. Okay, and since x is less than 3, um, it's going to end at x equals 3 with an open circle. Okay, it seems like x equals 3 is where all the action is happening, so that's probably the only spot on the x-axis I'm going to need to label. Okay, then when x is equal to 3, f of x equals 5. f of 3 equals 5, so we're just going to put a filled-in circle right there. And that's where the graph actually is. And then when x is greater than 3, f of x is natural log of x minus 2. And, and we'll say, you know, sometimes in these videos I might say log when I mean natural log, okay? Because in this class, natural log is the only log we care about. I think it's important to mention that, you know, <laughs> first class meeting. The natural log of x minus 2, it's like, ah, oh, I know kind of what that shape is. It, it grows, but it levels off. The, the graph is concave down if you took... AP Precal, uh, you know, that terminology. Um, but I might not know where the graph starts, you know, right at x equals 3. Like, or what, what is it supposed to start at, you know, if it was x is greater than or equal to 3? So I'm just going to think about natural log of 3 minus 2. And it's like, okay, that's natural log of 1. That's what I'm supposed to know. What special exponent do I put on e to get 1? Hopefully you're thinking of it, but maybe you need to write the, the argument of the log, the thing on the inside, that 1. You might need to write that as a power of e to convince yourself. And, okay, well, 1 is e to the 0. And natural log and and exponential with base e, they undo each other, you could think of it that way, and then you'd get zero. Okay, so we're going to start at y equals zero with an open circle, and then, you know, have a graph that kind of looks like that. So here we've got ourselves a sketch of the graph of f, and but we're interested in finding the one-sided limits of f as x approaches three. So I'm going to start with the left-hand limit as x approaches three from the negative side, See, the graph is getting closer to this open circle. Okay, and if we think about the y-coordinate of the open circle, we would just plug in x equals 3 to 2x plus 4. Okay, and then we would see 10, right? 2 threes is 6 plus 4 more. That's going to be 10. Then if we were to think about as x approaches 3 from the right-hand side, okay, and approaching along this piece of graph, and, okay, y is getting closer and closer to 0. So the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the positive side or from the right, that's going to equal 0. All right, and, you know, really that's, uh, I think that's, that's really the gist of the one-sided limits, um, at least when they come to piecewise defined functions. This function g of x is not written as a piecewise function, but I think you could come up with a, uh, with a piecewise equation for it that might be a little more descriptive of what the graph does. Okay, think about taking the absolute value of a number and then dividing it by itself. Sounds like it's going to come back 1, right? And it would, um, just as long as x was negative, uh, positive, but if x was negative, then I'd be taking a positive number divided by the negative version of itself, and that would give me negative 1. So I'm going to need y equals 1 and y equals negative 1. But if you think about what happens with g of 0, g of 0 isn't going to be defined because of division by 0. That's still not allowed. Never has been, won't be in this class. And so we're going to go along this way, and it's just going to be constantly 1 until I go over here, and when x is negative, g of x is going to be constantly negative 1. Okay, I think that's going to be a good enough sketch. It's not exactly to scale, um, but it, it's going to work. Okay, thinking about the limit from the left-hand side, that's going to be the limit as x approaches 0 from the negative side. Okay, I'm going along here. I'm constantly negative 1, and I'm getting well, closer and closer to this hole, which has y coordinate negative 1. And so I'm going to say that that one sided limit, limit as x approaches 0 from the negative side of g of x, that's going to equal negative 1. And for the limit as x approaches 0 from the positive side, right, I'm approaching from the positive side from the right, and y is constantly 1. And it's staying 1, and it's getting closer to that hole that has y coordinate 1. So I'm going to say the limit as x approaches 0 from the positive side of g of x. That's going to equal positive 1. 
I suppose that's nice too. Um, really this absolute value of x divided by x, this is just kind of a function that comes up from time to time in AP Calculus. I just need you to be aware of it. Okay, now we are ready for the definition of a limit, at least for AP Calculus. Um, if the limit from the right of a function and the limit from the left of a function both exist and both equal the same number, then we can say the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists and it equals that number that both of the one-sided limits were approaching. So at the very least, to draw a picture of this, this is going to be like the two pieces of graph are meeting up at a hole. Now we might have that hole filled in, and we'll have you know, a special name for that in a couple lessons from now, um, and it might not be filled in, it might be filled in elsewhere, or it might be nowhere at all. I think we've actually seen a couple of those scenarios um, so far today, um, but that's kind of just the picture of what we're looking at. Now, if I was to ask you about these limits here, take it back to where we started, the limit as x approaches 6 of this fraction, or the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x, that's, we could go back and look at our graph and table to determine that. All right, so looking at this thing here, okay, on the left, f of x as x approaches 6, from both sides, the graph is approaching 7. Okay, so I could go back and I'll say that the limit of that, that fraction is going to equal 7. But then if I look over here with g of x, that table that we made, the closer x gets to 0, okay, the closer g of x gets to 1. Or decimals are staying the same from both sides, okay, from the negative side and from the positive side. And so we're going to say that limit is equal to 1. Okay, and what would get a, you know, a situation where a limit fails to exist, you know, here in a couple of minutes. Okay, but assuming that the limit of f of x as x approaches 1 exists, what is the value of k? This is a problem type uh, I just need you to be aware of in this class, because uh, it takes a bunch of different forms. It's not always like the limit exists. It, like Later it'll be like the function's continuous, or it's differentiable or something. Um, and so, but this is the kind of the first way you could interact with this problem. And really, this picture, this is what we need, right? If the limit exists and the limit from the right-hand side needs to equal the limit from the left-hand side, these two pieces of graph need to meet up at the same spot. Now, I know it's going to be a hole in the graph because x is switching from less than 1 to greater than 1, so there's nothing, no indication of what's supposed to happen at x equals 1, so it must be undefined. Um, and, but, you know, how am I going to find the value of k? Not by drawing a picture, that's for sure. Um, I'm going to need to use algebra. And so I'm going to set these two things equal to each other because I need to have the same y-coordinate, the same output when x equals 1. Okay, so 3x minus k is going to equal x squared plus k. And that needs to happen at the point where x equals 1, you know, like right there. Okay, so I'm going to say, all right, 3 times 1 minus k, that's going to equal x squared, because that's 1 squared plus k. And so that's 3 minus k equals 1 plus k, and if you want to solve this one with your eyes, that's fine. If you want to add a k to both sides and subtract a 1 and divide by 2 mentally, you can do that. Um, if you want to do it you know, physically and actually write all the steps, be my guest. doesn't really matter. This is a calculus class, not an algebra class. That's kind of my message. So we're getting k equals 1. That is our answer. What's really important is that we set the two things equal to each other plugged in the relevant x value, and solved our equation. All right, so I think now we should talk about, you know, situations when the limit doesn't exist. Back to our definition, um, we could have, like, one of the one-sided limits non-existing. That wouldn't be all that interesting. Um, we could have them both existing but not equaling the same number, or, you know, there's some situations that you may not have considered. Okay, so I'm going to go down here and, and show you some reasons for limit non-existence. And, you know, I, not that, especially oscillation, that's not going to be relevant to us here. Um, honestly, unbounded behavior, not until next time either. But um, I think it's important to lay these out at the beginning uh, because they kind of correspond to, you know, some reasons for discontinuities and, and other things like that later on. Uh, reasons for failing to be differentiable and, and 
I think that's it. But um, the one-sided limits disagree. Well, that would be just if from the left I was approaching one thing and from the right I was approaching something else, you know, regardless of where the function actually was. You know, it could be here, it could be here, it could be up here, it could be elsewhere, it could be nowhere, right? But the one-sided limits disagree is really what's happening on, like, near the function, not at that point. Um, and so we'd see like some sort of jump or something, two different behaviors, that's gonna be limit doesn't exist. Okay, unbounded behavior, that basically means a vertical asymptote. So it could look, you know, kind of like this. You know, we, we know about vertical asymptotes, they can take a variety of shapes and flavors, um, but you know, definitely the limit's not existing because the function isn't getting closer and closer to one specific value. Okay, and then oscillation, that one's kind of a weird one. Um, I'm going to pull up a picture of it for you, I think. Okay, so kind of the classic picture of this is y equals sine of 1 over x near x equals 0. This one's just going to be oscillating back and forth, and it's not going to have any discernible behavior. Um, so I'm going to show you a graph of it kind of on a limited window. I'm going to zoom in and show you that the closer I look, okay, well, okay yeah, here we go. Um, the graph gets really dense. And if I was to do that again, you'd see there's just like a lot of waves near x equals zero. And the, and the graph is, is pretty much everywhere as you get really close to zero. And we're not getting closer and closer to one specific value. And, you know, the value of this function here, the sine of one over x, it's certainly not defined at x equals zero. So its limit does not exist at x equals zero. Okay, now to conclude this one, I'm going to show you the graph of a function I think is kind of cool. Um, this is one I didn't really know about before relatively recently overall in my over, you know, math journey. Um, arc tangent of 1 over x. So this thing has got two different things going on near x equals 0. And if I asked you, hey, what's the limit as x approaches 0 of h of x, okay, you would hopefully tell me uh, that this limit doesn't exist because of that disagreement in the one-sided limits. Now, if I asked you to answer that question and give me a reason, I want to train you on like the best way to do it. Okay, we want to be really explicit with our reasons, as you'll see moving forward in this course. Like, we really need to be careful with our language. All right, so first, we're going to clearly answer the question. We're going to say the limit does not exist, and we can abbreviate that with D and E in this class. Everybody will know what you mean if you write D and E. And then we're going to give a reason, so we'll say because, and really it's the disagreement in the one-sided limits. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the negative side of h of x is not equal to the limit as x approaches 0 from the positive side of h of x. And that's going to be our reason. Um, and that's like a really good response to the question, you know, what's the limit as x approaches 0 of h of x in this case? All right, so I think that, you know, that's going to be all we need for this video. I'm going to come back in the next one. We're going to talk about limit properties. Um, but I think this is, you know, we've given our definitions. We've been a couple of solid examples at this point. You just need to move forward and practice on your own and, and make sure you're understanding. So good luck with that, and thanks for watching.